kids and I knock down all of your mom. I think it's time to welcome Libby and get Libby to talk about her experiences in rugby and other opportunities that kids and, and coaches and people can have in rugby. Thanks so much, Sean. So firstly, just a little bit of background about myself. Uh, my name is Libby Alice von Rensburg. I'm currently working as the program coordinator for Tux Women's Rugby, and I'm also the captain of the Delta Drone Tux Women's Rugby team. Um, so how I got involved in rugby and how rugby has shaped me, just to give you some info there, it all started in 2013 when I left school. I didn't really know uh, where I was going in life, apart from the fact that I wanted to play any sport. I was busy training one day at Elsie de Villiers uh, for the Touch Rugby World Cup when Coach Rian approached me and asked if I would like to try playing sevens rugby. Now, as most people are, I was very hesitant, uh, and so were my parents. But when Coach Rian mentioned that I would be playing in Paris for the first, uh, in, within a few weeks with the team, he had me hook, line, and sinker. Um, but to be honest, it was terrifying and it was tough. And I did question my decisions uh, to play the sport. But then the next trip that the team went on was the Dubai Sevens. And well, of course, I haven't been to Dubai ever in my life. So once again, I was in on that. I did come to realize, however, that I was not conditioned to play the sport at all. And um, so I took it upon myself to work on that a little bit. Fast forward to the following year, where I started, uh, started studying at the University of Pretoria. And that is when my rugby career started taking off. I was one of the first female players to receive a bursary for, from Tux Rugby and I ended up getting my sports science degree, my high certificates in education and my honours in sports management all with distinction while playing rugby and travelling the world. I had the honour of captaining not only the Tux Women's Rugby team but also the Blue Bull Sevens team as well as the, student, the SA student team. I've represented the Springbok Select team in Las Vegas and I've recently received the amazing opportunity uh, in the beginning of last year to travel to New Zealand and to attend a rugby academy there where I played for the Mount Marlins. So I have been quite blessed uh, with many local and international awards um, along my career. And now I'm lucky enough to be in the position where I work in an environment which allows me to continue playing the sports I love while paving the way for younger girls to do, to do the same. So I'm gonna get up my slide here for you. There we go. Okay. So as we all know, women's sevens rugby is one of the fastest growing sports in the world currently, and it has since been included in the Olympics as an Olympic sport. So it requires athletes to be fast, agile, but also strong and skillful. And it's an, it's an extremely exciting game to watch. And if you blink, you might just miss the whole thing. So Tux, uh, Tux Women's Rugby is uh, fortunate enough to be sponsored by Delta Drone, which is a French mining company. The sponsorship has enabled our team to play in tournaments all across the globe. And these experiences have allowed us to be known not only as the best women's sevens club in South Africa, but in Africa. Our club is also the number one feeder club to the Springbok Women's Sevens team. So our team has been the reigning champions for the USA Sevens for the past seven uh, for the past five years, except for 2016 when our team played in the October Fest Sevens and we won that tournament. And it just happened to be scheduled at the same time as the USA, so we picked the international travel above the student uh, tournaments. We also won the inaugural Women's Varsity Sevens tournament last year. Our international tournaments include locations such as France, Spain, Germany, Italy, and Dubai, to only mention a few. So these trips are all paid for by our sponsor, with the player's biggest expense being visas and spending money. Uh, we will always make time to do some sightseeing during our trips, giving our players the opportunity to experience different cultures and lifestyles along the way. Oops, sorry. Here you can see some images of our girls uh, playing internationally. And then I just want to move your attention over to this video, uh, which was made after our Oktoberfest 7th tournament.
I must apologize for the sound not working there. Um, okay, so obviously our biggest selling point at Saks Women's Rugby is of course the international travels. Let's just get this not going. Um, it is our international travels. Uh, but putting that aside, we need to move on to the study aspects of things. So at Tux Women's Rugby, we have been slowly making progress with our bursaries and receiving slightly more funding each year, which we use to recruit aspiring players and assist girls in need. So in the past two years alone, we have received an increase of 30% in the available bursaries, with a 64% increase in applications for women's rugby bursaries, which is absolutely amazing. So although we are not yet in the position of handing out full bursaries to players, including accommodation, et cetera, et cetera, we do believe that every little bit can help. We have had players studying everything from sports science and education to architecture and law. And one of our star players, Megan Phillips, who you can see here, has just graduated with her engineering degree. Our Tux, our Tux Women's Rugby alumni include Sunny, who obtained her Master's in Applied Mathematics, Lazan, who now owns her own veterinary clinic, and Akila, who is a practicing medical doctor. So the point that I'm trying to make here is that our players cannot be put in a box in terms of their academics. These are all players from different study fields with a passion for rugby. Our number one priority, though, is to ensure that our players succeed not only on the field, but academically as well. And in saying that, we play, when, we play, when we do play abroad, we will always try and accommodate our student athletes by fitting these tournaments into the academic calendar without any disturbances to the players' academics. Now, of course, I'm going to stop the sharing before I continue. Great. Um, of course, in South Africa, we don't have so many girls playing rugby um, at a schooling level, which is one of our biggest downfalls, uh, I think. Um, although there are a few youth structures in place, very few people are aware of this and very few girls um, participate in these structures. So because of this, we don't expect girls to come to us with any rugby experience. When she arrives after school, she would have probably played sports like netball or hockey. Um, so our main criteria is athleticism. Rugby is something that can be taught, but athleticism is something that most players have naturally or they don't. So we have had some of our most successful players joining us from sports such as athletics, touch rugby and netball. Megan Phillips, you saw there, came to us from athletics actually. Um, but most of our girls and the parents as well are very skeptical in terms of the, as uh, the, the contact aspect of the game. And um, when you watch, well, it's understandable of course, but this is why seven rugby is ideal for the ladies. So if you watch men's play versus uh, the ladies, you'll see that the men enjoy the contact, uh, whereas the women take a, a more smarter strategic approach to the game, if you could put it that way. So just to finish off, it's pretty obvious that Tax Women's Rugby Club holds the key to the world. Um, these girls will get opportunities that very few people, let alone athletes from other sports, receive by simply taking a chance and giving Simmons Rugby a shot. So it's time for us to break, break new pathways, um, encourage our ladies to try new things. Who knows, they might be able to study and play rugby and see the world. Uh, Sean, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to chat to the people, to the coaches. Um, I really do appreciate it. And hopefully some of you guys know some ladies who can get involved, come through from other sports, uh, get in contact with the club, and we can help them out in some way. Thank you, Libby. Um, I think the first question um, from my side is, um, what are the structures currently in women's rugby in South Africa? So at the moment, we do have youth, the youth structures specifically are for your girls under 16 and under 18. Um, if you look at your difference, such as New Zealand, Australia, those bigger countries that are very competitive with their women's rugby, they have their girls playing rugby with the boys at a biblical rugby level from a very young age. Um, I think having a lady start playing only at 16, you've already missed so much that they could have caught on if, if they had started playing rugby earlier. So from a youth aspect is that we do have a lot of clubs that are trying to you know, get the ball rolling. I am working with many clubs, trying to organize uh, friendly tournaments and so on when we're allowed to play. 
Um, but it's very difficult because we don't get a lot of support from the unions necessarily, um, from the public. It's very difficult to get the girls from point A to point B to play some competitive rugby in our country. Now, you, you've toured, toured um, a little bit around the world. What countries have you been to? Uh, where, where have you actually played? I have been to New Zealand. I've been to Australia, um, Italy, France, Germany, Dubai. My favorite, however, is uh, New Zealand. I think the rugby culture there is amazing. Um, you, you'd expect the South Africans to have, we have a ridiculous rugby culture, but those New Zealanders take it to a next level for me. I, I see by watching women's rugby, like the, the sevens and the 15 uh, rugby in New Zealand, Australia, and the UK. I mean, they, their rugby is at a completely different level. It's, I mean, those women are athletically fit. They, they're big, they're strong, they're powerful. They, they, the speed of the game is so much more different than the rest of the world. How can we kind of play catch up? So, you know what, it's very difficult. Um, we only have ourselves to blame for that happening. Um, if you look at when we started with the sevens and everything, we used to play against a, a country like Kenya and we used to beat them easily. And as the years have gone, our ladies have never gotten the opportunity to play more competitively, playing against New Zealand, playing against Australia more often. And Kenya has caught up to us now. And now when you watch our SA ladies play against Kenya, it's always a close match. And it, we should have never let it get to that level. So I think because they have such great structures, such great support in the different countries, they, their girls are playing rugby at school. They have so many competitive leagues. Not only, every school has up to three teams in an age group. And they have leagues per age group for schools, for provincial. Um, they have junior, junior Black Ferns, for example. So all of that plays a huge role in the success of your national team. Yeah, that's the support that, that you get from quite a few of these sides is, is massive. Now, now you spoke about um, the educational side of, of playing sport. Now, one of the coaches that's actually listening today is Roland Butcher from um, the West Indies. He's got a program through uh, cricket and, and football to get guys also to give them opportunity to study in, in, in the West Indies. You've got guys like, um, I, I, there's, there's actually a rugby program on for Germany because they want to improve their rugby. So they're not looking for our top SA schools kind of players, but they're looking for players that enjoy the game and play decent rugby to uplift their game, but at the same time get a degree in, in um, uh, Germany. Now you've had some opportunities that, that you've actually been approached to go and study abroad. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about those opportunities and, and what kind of opportunities overseas are there for, for uh, female or male rugby players? Look, in the, for, for female uh, players specifically, we are not in a position of receiving what the men receive. If you want to go overseas and play there, you can't go, for a, go play for a club there and expect them to pay your salary or to you know, pay your studies. Um, I think a lot of the clubs and the universities will try to assist you however they can. Um, similarly with us, we cannot afford to give 100% bursaries to the players, but they will help the players in whatever way they can. They can put you in a housing system with a different family or so on um, to help get you there. Um, but in the end of the day, if you want to go there, it's going to have to be on your own cost and you have to decide whether it's something, whether you want to invest in yourself or if you're just going to stick it out at home and hope for the best. Yeah, I mean, a lot of that is that even if you do have a, a big professional career, um, like a lot of the, the men have got the opportunity, unfortunately, due to finances, you guys don't. But your career ends very quickly. And you know, we've got Richard that's, that's going to be talking soon. It, you do need to have something to fall back on. How do you encourage players? Because, I mean, I know you work in the, in the female sector and with the, with the female players, but there's a lot of work interaction between all the different um, um, you know, groups within rugby or actually within various sports with, at, at Tux. How do you encourage um, these top athletes to carry on studying and working towards a degree? So one thing that all the players need to be aware of is the fact that injuries do occur. You may plan on playing rugby for seven or eight years because that's what you think you want to play until you are 30 or 31. Um, I think the ladies have a little bit of a longer lifespan with the rugby, especially if you play sevens due to the fact that it's not so hard on the body. You can push it for a little bit longer. Um, but I think the reality is that players need to realize that injuries do happen and your career can be cut short at any moment. 
So if you haven't made the time and put in the effort to invest in yourself early on in your career, um, you, might, you might suffer the consequences of that sooner than what you'd expect. Um, you can't expect to, for your career to carry you after you've played. Um, I know, I mean, a lot of the big rugby guys stop playing, but they still have sponsorships and they're still involved in the rugby and, you know, they can still make it work. But it's not possible for everyone, especially for the ladies. If you do not get in there early enough, you're going to walk away from the rugby scene. Everyone's going to forget your name and you're not going to have anything to fall back on. So it's very, very important. We do encourage our girls, um, our students especially, to focus more on the academics. Should they have exams during the time, um, we try not to put too much pressure on them to attend practices. We, we are very lenient and considerate um, in terms of that because the players' academics are actually number one. And um, as you mentioned, rugby is not, is not a lifetime career. So you know, you've just mentioned injuries. What kind of injuries do, are, are the injuries different between the, the women rugby players compared to the men? Or what kind of, what's your, what common injuries do you guys have? I think a lot of the injuries sustained for the ladies are concussions. I think that's just because players might not be conditioned. We're not necessarily ready for contact when we first go into the game. Um, taking that first hit, you, you don't expect it and you don't realize how much force your body can handle. Um, but I think our ladies do, concussions is definitely a big thing. Even when you just go to the ground wrong, um, it's definitely something that I've seen a lot. We've seen a lot of knee, shoulder injuries and so on. Once again, I think all of this comes down to conditioning um, players that aren't conditioned properly that sort of get pushed a little bit too hard or expected to play a little bit too soon. Look, there are the weird cases where someone who is, you know, top fit, super conditioned, you do get injured by having a strange tackle or being in a weird situation. Um, but I think a majority of the injuries from the women game, especially if I look at your club and your amateur level in South Africa, is due to the fact that the ladies aren't conditioned properly. I mean, they'll come to the field, maybe I've played, you know, trained three or four times together, and then they expect to play a sevens game. And you might think that because it's only seven minutes a half, it's not going to be that bad. Um, but accidents do happen. Um, I think, yeah, I think the ladies just, it all comes down to conditioning for them. No, I, I mean, I, I played rugby for quite a few years and then I took a bit of a break and went back again. The biggest um, thing for me, and, and this comes to the concussion, is taking that hit again. Now we've had a whole year, um, even though the, the people are starting to play now, there hasn't been contact. Um, how can we start preparing the players to take that kind of contact um, now that the season's starting? I mean, the, the men started last week and I really see with the Springbok squad, there's already so many injuries and mm. people pulling out of this weekend's game. How can we actually start preparing for it? Yeah, I think your preseason conditioning is going to be extremely crucial now. Um, in the past, it's always, I think the players sort of look at preseason as, oh, you know, we just start getting into things and then the season hits and you go full speed. Um, the people need to realize how important, how crucial this year's preseason is going to be. Because uh, as you mentioned, injuries are happening all over the show because players haven't been having any contact. Um, yes, our ladies are training by themselves at home, but contact fitness is something that you can't necessarily train when you're by yourself. It's something that you have to train on the field with your team. Um, I think a lot of our, our teams, because our ladies aren't used to playing rugby from a young age, they spend a lot of time working on skills like passing, um, tackling, running with a ball, and we forget about the conditioning aspect because we just want them to be able to play the game. And that's where the injuries start coming in. So I think it is very, very important. Um, the athletes, especially the coaches, are going to have to be super strict with this year's pre-conditioning, pre pre-season, and all of that going into next year. Because if we walk into next year without having a proper pre-season, we're going to lose so many more athletes. And unfortunately, in the ladies' sector at the moment, we can't afford to lose players. We don't have players. We don't have what the men have to choose from. <laughs> Um, I've got a question here. What, what rugby academy did you play for in New Zealand and what did you learn from that academy? So I attended the Inside Running Academy. It's in Tauranga. And I played for Mount Manganui Club, also known as the Mount Marlin. Uh, one thing that definitely stood out to me was their, their way of coaching. Um, they break things down a lot more than what we do. Um, I also quite enjoyed the fact that it was one academy and the ladies and the, and the gents all trained together, um, which was great because you often find times when the ladies are so scattered all over the place 
when there's one lady that's at the top and one at the bottom, the one at the top will start to lower her standards just for the rest of the pack to come by. So I quite enjoyed pushing myself, comparing myself to the boys a little bit more. Um, it really, it, it helped me grow as a person and it helped me develop my skills. Um, but in terms of the coaching, every day we, there was a different coach for every session, getting different inputs um, from those people, those, you know, experienced players as well. Um, it's really, it was really eye-opening for me to be there, um, to take it a lot more. I think a lot of the times in South Africa, the coaches might assume that the ladies know things, but we don't. You'll walk into the field, you don't, you've never tackled somebody in your life. So to have someone break it down to the smallest, and I think girls, girls, that's how we thrive. We want to know exactly why, how, when, where must what be um, in order to execute this thing properly. So by telling me just, okay, you yeah, tackle with your shoulder versus, okay, you're going to bend, you're going to look here, breaking it down like that, it really, it really helped me just to grasp it a little bit better, I think. I think that actually goes on to not just the, the uh, women and women's rugby. I think that go, should go into a lot more uh, men's rugby. I did some training sessions with John Mitchell, and he'll mm -hmm. sit and talk for 10, 15 minutes on exactly, well, five, 10 minutes on exactly what you must do and why you must do it. And if you don't do it, what the, the, the result uh, w of that would be. I mean, how, how can we get that across now into South African rugby at school rugby? Because we, we do have still quite a bit of, uh, whilst the kids are playing, somebody uh, coach from the sidelines just shouting all the instructions and the kids not, um, not learning from it. They just copy and, and follow. Um, how can we actually incorporate into that, in that in South African rugby across the board? I think coaches tend to forget the importance of having a sit-down session with your team and explaining things very nicely. You just want to get to the field. You have your hour. You don't want to waste anything. You want to do 20 minutes of passing, 20 minutes of this. And we get so excited and wanting to do things, having the kids physically do things, that we forget that sometimes you just need to slow down a little bit, explain things rather, rather take 20 minutes out of your session to properly demonstrate, show them, have each player testing it out, helping them individually adjusting here and there, and then moving on to the actual skill and putting more speed on the ball and so, so on and so on. So I think that's one thing that we should maybe try and incorporate a little bit more in SA Rugby. Um, it's quite, uh, this is an interesting question, and, and I think it also goes back to retaining players. So, firstly, um, it's asking about the rag Rugby Women's Sevens um, and the World, Rugby World Sevens World Cup. And do you guys have different age groups? Because I know that we, talk, we have a lot with the under 20s and with, with men's rugby, and used to have under 19s and under 21s. Do you have like um, age group Rugby Sevens tournament, World Rugby Sevens tournaments? For the Sevens, unfortunately, in South Africa, we don't have the age groups. Um, it is very, very unfortunate because I think our ladies will thrive more in the sevens um, than in the 15s. Our teams are struggling. We're struggling to get numbers. Um, I think we should take these few very athletic players that we have, put them into the system and foster them from a young age. If I look at the number of young girls that have come out of school into our tuck system, if all of them had been put in an under-20 um, team, for example, we, we would have been at a level com being competitive with New Zealand and with Australia now at this point. And how do you retain your players? Because you, you're talking about now injuries and might lose players due to injuries. I think it's quite difficult to have that, that retain players. And I think there's also a stigma still behind women playing rugby that you still have to deal with. Um, I, I know the, the approaches women have got the same kind of thing with, in the cricket space where there's a, a certain stigma that they have to deal with, um, uh, you know, just the pre preconceived ideas. And we've got so many female fans that could be actually players. What stigmas are you talking about? Sean, there's no stigmas with women's rugby. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is very, very difficult um, when injuries come to maintain players because the, the pool of players is so small. Um, which is why we go out of our way to try and recruit as or to give bursaries to as many players as possible so that we know we have a few players, at least 10 or 12 players that we can constantly roll during tournaments. You'll play, we'll play half in this one and then half in the next tournament. So I think it's player management at the end of the day is going to be very, very important. It is very important for us. Um, considering the stigmas that we face, as you mentioned, the cricket ladies, 
have, have the same struggles. I'm sure the hockey ladies have the same struggles. Um, I think if we look at many, many years ago when women first started playing sports, whether you played netball or whatever, it was the same stigmas. The only difference is that those more girly sports have now progressed past that and are accepted as girl sports. So we just have to continue chiseling away at it and eventually we'll also get to the point where a rugby is not a men's sport, it is a sport for those who love it. And that's where we should be. I used to coach um, a team in Italy, um, Cus Perugia. We, we, were in the, we played in the Premier League in Italy. And the, rugby was, was, women's rugby was quite big, actually, in those days. Um, but still, even though it was quite big, we'd always get the COD field to, to train on or to play on. Um, is that kind of um, discouraging for, for you guys when you see that you get put into a backfield? Or do you just love the game and you don't really care as long as you get an opportunity to play? I think for many of our players, I have noticed it is disheartening, uh, especially for us. Attacks. We train on the F field and the men train on the A and the B field. It's, it is a struggle. Uh, it, I think it's more of a mental battle for the ladies than anything else. Um, but on the other hand, when I'm involved with the men, they are always the first to complain about how women are always traveling all over the world and they don't get to travel like we do. So I think you have to choose your battles. You have to decide where, where you want to voice your opinions and what you want to do. Um, I think a lot of the time the men don't realize what, what they have and what gets put into men's rugby. Um, all they see is, oh, but the girls are traveling overseas. That's unfair. But we, we, we travel overseas. We live in hostels. A lot of times the ladies might have to buy their own food and so on. We're not staying in the best accommodations. And we'll only go for a weekend. We'll fly in on the Friday, play Saturday, and fly back on the Sunday. So it's not, it, sounds, it sounds, you know, luxurious from their point. Um, and it is great. But on the other hand, they have these huge competitions that get shown on TV. They have mega sponsorships. Um, they all get kits all the time, on-field kits, off-field kits. They get salaries. They get meals before and after games. So there's a lot of things that weigh out this, this battle of, yeah, but the girls get this and the boys get this. And I also always tell the ladies when they come and complain about, yeah, but the boys train on the nicer fields and the boys get this and that. I tell them, well, you can choose to get all of those things and then we just won't travel. So you have to choose what you want at the end, at the end of the day. This, this question kind of fall, falls in line with that. And it's, there's been a big movement um, worldwide. We've seen with uh, the American women's football side. Um, and now with South Africa, last year we've had some phenomenal rugby results. So suddenly we come in the forefront. The netball women have done well. But why do you think um, it is difficult for women's rugby to get sponsorship or women's sport to get sponsorship in, in general? And why is the media coverage so much less in men's sport? I think specifically in South Africa, we don't have women's rugby that is on a standard to show um, on, on TV yet. Um, I mean, if you look at the, the boys' rugby, Craven Week and all of those things, it gets shown on TV because it's quality rugby. I think we as coaches and staff that's involved with women's rugby need to take it upon ourselves and, and realize that we're not going to simply just get handed everything on a silver platter. We can't expect to receive everything the same as the men. We can't expect our ladies to get the same salaries. We can't expect to be on TV if we are not delivering um, a similar quality sport. So I think that is our biggest, that's our biggest downfall at the moment. Um, and I think the players do, they, they do get disheartened by it, but they need to realize that we're not on that level yet. It's going to take a few years um, for us to reach a competitive level in South Africa, having many clubs competing at such a level for us to show it on TV. Um, I think if you look at the international scene in uh, New Zealand now, they're playing the Freya Palmer Cup and that is, it's shown on TV every weekend, the men play and the women play in the, the, in the cup. But that's because they play competitive, high quality rugby. Um, it's obviously not being shown by us because I think our country is still very new to this whole women's rugby thing. There's a lot of people that are still sort of haven't really come bought into this concept yet. Um, I think we just need to be patient. I think our time will come. Um, it's not, it's not going to come next year. It's not going to come the year after that. But the ladies are involved now. We are the pioneers of this. We need to keep pushing. And um, hopefully in 10 or 15 years, you'll be able to see the Blue Bulls women playing live on TV. Is it a bit of a catch-22? Because you, you've got in one sense that... Um 
you, you need to get to that level to get more, more sponsorship and more coverage, but you can't get to that level unless you don't have the coverage and, you know, if you don't have the coverage and sponsorship. So does it end up being a bit of a catch 22 situation? No, 100% definitely is. Um, it's going to be a continuous battle, but then you get companies like Delta Drone, who's taken a chance on us. Um, MasterCard has sponsored the Pirates Club in Johannesburg now, as well. They attended the Dubai Sevens last year because of this sponsorship. So it just takes one or two companies to buy into the idea um, to support women in sports for us to start paving the way forward. Yeah, we, we do have um, some guys that, that really support women's sport and support um, a lot of sport, especially the school sports side of it. I mean, we've got Theo Garen who's listening today. And he's often at, at um, uh, women's sporting events, putting it out in the newspapers. So you, you do have some of the guys that, that give you a lot of support, but um, sometimes it's very difficult. I think it's uh, an untapped kind of market. So you're sitting here now where, with, with, let's say, men's rugby, there's so many people fighting for the same piece of the pie. Meanwhile, there's very little happening you know, in, in trying to cover women's rugby, and it's a whole new market that you can work at. Um, how do you approach um, these sponsors to try and get them to carry on um, um, supporting you and following you? Sean, as I mentioned, it's difficult to sell something that doesn't have any value yet. Um, we still need to get our ladies to that point where it, we will get there when it's easy to walk up to someone and be like, hey, have you seen so-and-so this club playing? And they'll be like, oh, yes. You know, that's where we want to be. But we aren't there yet. So what we need to do now is we need to uh, take the development approach. We need to um, explain to these companies how they will help develop and grow and help individual female athletes um, to, to achieve greater things. And I think in, in the world at the moment, there is a lot of movement happening in terms of women's sports and supporting females in sport. So I think that is definitely a wave that we need to get on and we need to ride it all the way. So how many women, other women's clubs are there in, in Gauteng or in South Africa in general? What are the big competitive clubs that, that people can register for or try and join? Sean, I know in Cape Town there are many clubs there. Um, the, the biggest struggle that we have is that for us, touch rugby, we only play sevens. So we don't compete in 15s, um, but provincially it's just 15s. So the sevens interprovincials got cancelled in 2016, I think was the last one. And I think that was a big downfall for us as a country. It was just as the first Olympic Games hit. Um, we, I think our, our SA ladies was using that sevens tournament as a feeder into, into their system. And I remember each year how many girls got called up to camps. And that was one way for them to scout players. Where I think now majority of our clubs play 15s. It's difficult to scout at the 15s game because a sevens player could easily play play 15s but as 15s player is not necessarily going to be able to adapt to the seven team um as easily i don't ever i don't think victor matfield for example would have been able to play sevens he's quite big and i don't know if he's as fast and agile as the sevens players so i think that is it's definitely it's a problem for us um our, our clubs don't come together enough to compete and we don't have competitive club leagues or club competitions to play in. Uh, from the Tuck side, we try to organize friendly tournaments um, with our neighboring clubs, so with Pirates, um, UJ, uh, uh, um, Portugal Women's, they'll come through. But it's all very, very developmental still. Um, you can't bring these teams together and expect to see fire rugby. It's very developmental. It's always for the growth of the game to get girls to come play. We'll often use our, have our new girls playing there just to have them get a feel of the game um, so that they don't get thrown into the deep end like I was in an in a international tournament. Um, now, I've seen, for example, with um, uh, you spoke about Kenya. And they've actually taken a step back saying, let's, we do have 15 rugby, but let's focus on our sevens and get our sevens right and attract more people to the game, and then let's look at our 15s rugby. Do you think that's a step that we should be taking in South Africa for women's rugby? I definitely think it's something we can consider. Um, if you look at the history of our 15s team, we, we're not moving on. We're not getting anywhere. We're not progressing. So why not try and change it up a little bit? Let's shift the focus completely to the 7s um, until 
we, as you mentioned, until the sevens, it's up and running and very competitive. And then we can move on and focus on the 15s again. Um, I think it's, it's something that we, we're going to have to make a shift somewhere. We can't continue struggling, struggling with our results. And then everyone points fingers and questions, but why is the women's rugby where it is in South Africa? But we're not trying anything new. I think it's, it's time for us to try something completely different. Um, whether that happens or not, I don't know. But I think it's definitely time, time to make a shift there. Uh, we've been asked a question. What are you busy studying at the moment? At the moment, I'm not studying anymore. I finished studying last year and I regret it terribly because this would have been a great year to do my master's mm. considering that we're not traveling as much. Um, but yes, I'm not studying at the moment. Uh, what did you say you, were stu you studied last year? I completed my honors in sport management and recreation. Okay. Um, I've, I, heard, I heard from the ladies at, at um, the, or the other people that you actually work with at Tux that you're very driven. So when you set out to, to achieve a goal, you set out and you actually get it done. So I, does that come from the challenges that you're facing or is it just a personal attribute that you got? I think it comes from the challenges that I've faced in my life. Um, nothing was ever just handed to me. I always had to work a little bit harder. Um, so I think that that essentially shaped me into the person that I am today. And I try my best to give some of that to my teammates as well, or to overflow onto them, um, for them to have that same drive, especially when we're playing overseas. It's, it's very difficult at times like now to keep our goals motivated, to keep training at home. So I will post workout videos every single day on our WhatsApp group, uh, motivate the ladies to do it. Because there is going to come a time when you walk back onto the field and then everyone's going to realize, oh, flip, we should have maybe worked out a little bit during the, during the lockdown time. Or we're going, to work, we're going to walk onto the field and we're going to completely dominate the other teams because they would have been the ones sitting at home saying, oh, it's okay, everyone's not training now. Um, I've been asked a question, what other universities also have rugby? So all of the, the universities have seven rugby. So the USAS is the University Sports South Africa uh, tournament. Um, then from that, the top four teams played in the Varsity Sevens last year. So most of the universities you have, University of Venda, for example, UCT, University of Durban, all of these universities have sevens. Um, they just, uh, I think they don't put so much effort and time into it. So I, I reckon maybe the, the teams will come together a month or a month and a half before tournaments, throw some goals together, and then they'll go and play the tournaments and hope for the best. Whereas at Tux, we are training the whole year through. Um, we don't have, like the men, a seven season and a 15 season. For us, we play sevens the whole year. Um, especially in Europe, their, their seven season is throughout, it's from May -ish to, to August. So we'll train for, that, for those tournaments, um, majority of the games then obviously being played there. Um. Now, Paul Dalport, um, listen to a little bit of, of your chat now and stuff. What's your, what's the communication like? He's, he's not on at the moment, though, unfortunately. But what's your communication like between the, the Springbok setup and Sevens and the, the different unions, different rugby or rugby teams? So um, at Tux Rugby, we have worked on our relationship with the Springboks, especially considering the fact that most of our players um, end up going into the Springbok system. Um, so we, we have a very close relationship and we try to work closely together to ensure that the ladies receive the most opportunities and the best opportunities, um, whether it be completing their studies first and then going to the Springbok setting or playing in a tournament with the Springboks and then coming back and playing with Tux. So we are trying our best to ensure that our, our club and the national team don't play in too many of the same tournaments. Because obviously, because the ladies aren't playing on the series circuit, they will play other um, invitational tournaments just as we do from Tux. So we need to try and ensure that we don't play in the same tournaments because, as I mentioned, we don't have a big player pool to choose from. So if they have all the players, then Tux is going to struggle because all of our players are there. So we have a very close relationship with that. Um, the Blue Bulls Rugby Union have also recently shown a little bit of more interest in, in us, especially considering we just played seven. Uh, we have had a bit, of a, a bit of a downfall for us is the fact that we don't play 15s. And um, I think that puts a lot of people off because everyone's focused on the 15s. Um, but it's time to make a shift. A lot of the smaller countries are focusing more on their sevens. The fact that it's an Olympic sport should be a big enough reason for us 
to say, you know what, all of our women's rugby funding needs to go into the sevens right now. Let's get that going. Let's get into the Olympics. Let's get onto the circuit, onto the series, and let's play there. Um, the 15s isn't playing as often as the sevens as well. So the series happens every single year where our ladies could be playing every single year all across the globe. That gets shown on TV. That is where we need to get in. We need to get in there, uh, get a little bit of exposure, and then get into the Olympics. From there, once we have those successes, then we can focus, okay, let's, move, let's focus now on the 15s. As I mentioned, they, they only play a World Cup now and then. They'll play maybe a few friendly games here and there. And it's a, lot of a, it's a longer game. And people aren't into the women's rugby thing yet. So we can't expect everyone to focus for 80 minutes on women's rugby. 14 minutes is just long enough. I think also that now that you've got the Olympics as part of your uh, Olympics Commonwealth Games, it, it does kind of sort of lead to more f a focus. What naturally you'd think of more of a focus on the sevens rugby. Um, I've actually got a question from Ansi, quite an interesting one. She says that you were a participant in the Ama Bokoro uh, program. What did, how did you experience that? And what is that? So it was uh, Becoming in Bokoro. It was a program that we shot last year. It was a reality program um, where the Springboks were scouting players for the, the, the going was that they were going to get some players from there, give them contracts, and they were going to play in the Cape Town Sevens which the ladies played in last year. Um, I don't know what happened in the end with all of that, but none of the, none of the players, including myself, that were involved in, the, in the, the reality show ended up getting the opportunity, which was quite disheartening for many of the girls. Many of the girls were a little bit upset about it. Um, but how it worked is we would train there, they would film us, and then every week someone would be eliminated, kind of like a survivor kind of thing, if you didn't perform well with a fitness or the passing drills and you'd get eliminated. It was very exciting. Um, I always loved being there in the Springbok system, getting the feedback from the coaches, being able to push myself. Um, but it was, quite, it was quite an experience, I must say, being part of a reality show. Um, and then, so besides for, because a lot of women, even if they, they want to join into the rugby program a bit later because of the passion that, that we have for, for, with women in, in rugby in general, um, what other opportunities are there besides for the actual playing opportunities for people to get involved in rugby? Look, our ladies have the opportunity of becoming referees as well. Um, I've seen a lot more young ladies refereeing boys' school games. Um, if you look at Amy Barrett, she's one of our top female referees in South Africa. And she is, she's paved the way now into the men's sector, uh, refing men. She also started from rugby, from touch rugby, coaching, playing. Uh, moved on to, I mean, she was a referee at the Olympic Games, which is also a great achievement. So if you don't, if you're not necessarily a player, that doesn't mean that you don't have to be involved in rugby at all. You can become a referee, you can become a coach. Um, as you mentioned, not all coaches were players um, in the day. It doesn't take, a good coach doesn't have to have been a player. So I think there is definitely starting to, the, the referee thing is really starting to get a role now. Uh, when I started playing as well, um, Henny from the Blue Bulls told me, but don't I want to become a ref? And I told him, well, I'm still focusing on my rugby as a player at the moment. Um, but I think if I didn't have a as bright future in the playing side, I would have definitely gone into the refereeing side. I must admit that Amy, because we saw quite often in um, at Craven Week, uh, refereeing at Craven Week, but um, suddenly she hit, even though she had been doing it for years before, and suddenly I think she... she they mentioned that she might have uh, um, a, a, her first game. It was the, the Craven Week in Paul that hosted a Paul Boys High. Next thing, there were queues of media guys wanting to interview her and talk to her. And I mean, she's phenomenal. She, she even ref the final, if I'm not mistaken, of Craven Week that year. Yes. Yeah, no, I know her personally. And she's a, she's a great player, great ref. Um, she's refed a few of our games um, at the Interprovincial Sevens as well. And yeah, she's just phenomenal. Um, I've got one a question of Coach Ash um, asks, why does Tux not compete in, in local SS7s tournaments? So for us, um, obviously we have our huge sponsor that allows us to play um, overseas. Um, unfortunately, the level of competition for us in South Africa is not up to standard. That is why we use all of our funding to go international. Um, to play against competitive rugby because there's no point in us hanging around here. Beating another team 50-0 is not really such a huge accomplishment, you know what I'm saying? 
Um, we'd rather go overseas, play against their clubs, play against other teams there. We play against Belgium quite often. And it's always a tight game. And that's what we want. We want our ladies to play competitive, tough rugby. And unfortunately, for now, the other clubs just aren't, aren't bringing it just yet. Um, no, it's a question from Theo. No, Theo's been to so many youth weeks. He's been to uh, both male and female youth weeks. And he says that girls' rugby doesn't seem to have taken root in former Model C and independent schools. Uh, you know, the, the so-called uh, sport powerhouses. Why do you think that is, given that a, a, a sport like water polo, which is also contact sport, is growing exponentially in those schools? Um, he's attended a lot of, these, a lot of these, these youth weeks, and he's actually found that um, the development side of it, so going through to township schools and, and those kind of schools, has actually been better than what it is in uh, former Model C and independent schools. I think it's very difficult um, to incite change in these big schools. Um, if you can get someone in the school, for example, a coach who has a women's rugby background or an educator in that school who has a women's rugby background who can drive it themselves in that school, it's going to be a lot easier. Um, but if there's no one in that school that is involved with women's rugby, it's going to be very, very difficult for us to get it in there. And I think that's where we need to start. We need to start getting, if you have your students that are studying education, now we have so many education rugby students as soon as they leave university and they go to school we need to tell them hey try and drive women's rugby try and get a sevens team um we're trying really hard to put together a school sevens festival for next year for the ladies um so hopefully if we can get one or two athletes in each school to do that for us it'll definitely help a lot um i think the, the big schools are so invested in like you say they big school sports then netball their boys rugby um, athletics and so on. It just it takes one person to get on the inside and and to start instigating it there. I know it's the same thing. Even though they get more, more exposure than you guys with women's cricket, and um, some schools do do it, especially in the Western Cape. There are a lot of schools mm. that play cricket in the Western Cape, but in other areas around the country, really struggle. And that's why I think that the approach is women's team is dominated by by players from the Western Cape. Um, Definitely, and the Western Cape is also full of women's rugby players as well. There's so many girls down there um, that are training, that are playing, but I don't know, our structures just need to be put in place a little bit better. So, well, thank you very much, Libby. Thank you so much for helping us out today. Um, and thank you so much for Tux also for contacting us and, and talking to us and um, uh, you know, pro approaching us to allow, allow you to actually speak here too today. This has been absolutely fascinating. And I think it's, it's something w what you've spoken about has got a lot to do, not only just with women's rugby, but also with men's rugby, that there are opportunities out there. There haven't been these, these youth weeks this year, but there are opportunities for people to actually have a career in rugby. And I mean, the coaches themselves are people that have got opportunities to have careers in rugby. It's not only just for the players. So kids out there, male, female kids, can all go out and actually achieve and, and have a full life still in the rugby or whatever sport they want to follow. Um, so thanks so much, Libby. And, uh, thanks so much, Sean. I really appreciate it. And I've always loved the opportunity to shine a little bit of light on the women's game. I feel like we don't get enough coverage. We don't get enough word out there. So any opportunity, thank you so much. It might all seem doom and gloom at the moment. But I think we just need to continue working, continue paving the way. One day we will reap the rewards.